So welcome, Patrick Palmer. <laughs> I'm here. Are we having a good time? Oh, I think we will. Thanks for having me. Oh, what do I do? Well, mostly having a good time. Just kidding. <laughs> but honest to God, it's it's a fun place to work. Um, so for what it's worth, probably that's actually even the true statement most days. <laughs> now, most people can say the same thing about what whatever they're doing these days. Um, yeah, what do I do? Uh, I'm director of product management for uh, the ProVideo products, specifically Premiere and After Effects. So I work with the team uh, that's producing these products and is working with customers, is working with everyone who is helping us to make the products better. I have the joy of being involved in, in looking at what's next. Uh, I also have the joy of working with industry bodies, seeing as to how we might want to improve future workflows, getting what's futuristic a little closer to what becomes pragmatic. Um, there's just all the joy and fun working in a creative industry. So I always am curious about how people got to where they're at. What What's your history? What's your background? What What mm -hmm. kind of schooling did you have? Tell us <laughs> about that. It's kind of funny. Uh, when, whenever I think about how I got here, it's actually hard to explain. And the only word that I would put at top is serendipity because I certainly didn't plan on much anything. Um, I went to a wonderful school, if you want to go that that far back. Uh, it's been a Waldorf school, and my parents really didn't look all that much into it at the time. It just felt like, in terms of everything that you know, you could see about that school, the architecture, the people just had events there. It just felt like a you know, just a great school in general in terms of the vibe you you got from it. At least that's the way my mother explained it to me years later. So it wasn't necessarily that kind of choice where you're just all in on the concept. It just felt like this is a great school. Let's go for it. Uh, I spent 13 years there and, and certainly enjoyed really all of the journey. Uh, and that taught me one thing already. Don't don't worry too much about specializing. Um, be curious and get it all, have the intake. Um, we've had an opportunity to do stage lighting. Um, there certainly were a lot of plays that's kind of part of the curriculum at any rate, but you can go a little closer and a little deeper if you'd like, uh, even outside of that schedule and just basically, you know, work on every play uh, that's going on throughout the school year. Uh, I was one of those people. <laughs> but we also had a big band. Uh, so that's actually pretty much what converted my parents' interest in me playing music in me having an interest in doing that because it was totally fun to play an instrument in that band and that switch from playing the piano to the xylophone to uh, eventually doing the drums, which has been the dream of everyone in that band. And only, you know, you only can ever get one person to, to play them for real. <laughs> so I worked rather hard to make sure that it became believable. I could be a drummer. I don't think I ever was, but <laughs> get the idea. I've been again already in that serendipity kind of moment enjoying this doing that and just sticking my nose into absolutely everything uh, and that didn't really stop ever so while um i actually then went on to study uh german literature language and um history specifically american history <laughs> oh. which for german at the time probably wasn't that uncommon we just have been fascinated with the us i think i, I think for at least as long as I'm working on this planet. And for me, that has personally never stopped. Um, yeah, um, what next? And then a good friend of mine just gave me a phone call at one point in time and said, I found it. And I said, okay, what exactly is it that you found? Uh, well, the business the business idea for our business said, okay, well, this, this joke is getting old because we've been joking for a number of years that we're eventually going to do a startup. We just could never figure out what it was all about. So we both just went on and did other things. Uh, in the meantime, I've done some professional photography work, not because I'm a pro, but because I've been asked to do pro work. And it turns out I've been doing that long enough without knowing it. <laughs> so I started getting paid for it, which was nice. And I also stuck my nose into design work. Again, not necessarily claiming that I'm a pro at anything or knowing anything about it, but that was at around the time InDesign came about. So I just felt the urge to know all about it and became massively fascinated with it and with the lack of knowledge specifically when it came to taking anything to a printer. And then there all of a sudden was that issue of, oh, how do we get to color accuracy? That became important later in my life. <laughs> uh, so there was so much going on. And so middle of the night, found it, found it. I said, well, you know, it's 2.30. It better be really something <laughs> worth talking about at this hour. And you bet. I actually stay up late at night 
most of the time. So this particular friend knew I might be awake. Fair enough. Uh, but yeah, so he just basically put out something wild, a frame sequence player of sorts, not necessarily knowing what it is to other people. Um, and then he got calls from Digital Domain, from Industrial Light and Magic, and from, uh, I think, Framestore was in at the time, Cinecide. So really all the big players in post-production. Um, and we both knew these names very well because we were both kind of cinema buffs. Um, so he said, well, so this is a, an industry we want to be in. I don't know what the product does exactly just yet, but there seems to be interest. The form is just basically blown up. <laughs> So let's do this. This became Iridus. Uh, the product became FrameCycler within matters of weeks. And from there on out, and for those of you uh, who haven't been around that long or haven't been part of that industry, uh, that was just a wonderful little tool, really, something that would allow for real-time playback on machines that were not anywhere near as well as equipped as we're used to today in terms of being able to play back a couple of high-resolution frames, right? That was That was just a requirement at the time that wasn't served by any particular product. So my friend Lynn Kaiser almost by accident invented something that became a real great, really great tool for the post-production industry. And from there on out, again, serendipity. We just met with some people in the industry who had crazy ideas and we were both crazy enough to not realize how big a mountain it is that we were about to climb. So we got uh, engaged in conversations around doing a digital grading product. That became speed grade. And then, you know, I'll take a shortcut. But a couple of years later, uh, Adobe had an interest in getting technology that would help Adobe to up the game when it comes to color grading for its core products, namely Premiere Pro. Um, we got acquired, or rather the technology had been acquired, if you want to be more specific. But I, for one, decided to stick with where the technology went. So <laughs> that's how I got to work with uh, the wonderful teams here at Adobe. And well, that's been 10 years ago. I'm still here. <laughs> you are. I'm going to bring, OK, I'm going to bring Neil and Mo on here. They've been waiting backstage. Yeah, and I've, uh, I have I first uh, got involved with Patrick back in uh, uh, spring of 2014 when i was starting to do some video we miriam and i had had our mm -hmm. our portrait studio for uh you know probably 30 years at that point and i'd starting to do some uh some video work and of course we'd had our own printing lab here right so uh what i liked was how it looked and so rather than spending time learning how to do the cutting which is what anybody getting into video should do excuse me this is the way to do it it's not how i did it but it's the way you mm -hmm. should do it um, so I wanted to make it look pretty. Well, it, we were used to running a, a Photoshop and Lightroom with our still images. So of course I went to Adobe Premiere Pro and found out they had this thing called speed grade. And I went in a period of about three months in the spring of 2014 from asking the most questions on the speed grade forum <laughs> to answering the most questions on that. the speed grade forum. And then I, one day I got this email that I was just kind of dumbfounded with. It was from this Patrick Palmer guy, and I had no idea who this was, wanting to know if I was going to go to NAB, whatever the heck that was, and if so, <laughs> he wanted to have dinner. And I had to, of course, do a web search because I had no idea what any of these was. And so Patrick Palmer, yes, Patrick Palmer, uh, and who was the, the head of this program I was working with. And NAB was the one of the largest trade shows in the world, 100,000 plus people going to Las Vegas in April of every year to deal with all things uh, uh, video and sound and audio and movies and, and TV broadcast and networking, everything, the whole shebang. Of, of motion media, as they refer to it down there, is their massive show. And uh, so I thought this was kind of a hoot, because you're a small town portrait photographer, right? So I went up to Miriam's office, where she's sitting right now, and said, uh, I just got this email from this Patrick Palmer guy, and, and kind of <laughs> laid it out, and I thought it was funny. And she was just sitting there looking at me like, <laughs> and I'm going, she's not reacting to this like it's a humorous thing. So, <laughs> Uh, I just kind of turned around, came back to my office, and I was sitting right here where I am now, and about five minutes later realized that she was standing behind me in the doorway there, just leaning against the doorway looking at me. And she says, if you were, if we were 20 years younger, you'd be going. And I'm going, yeah, but I'm not. And she goes, you're going, and turns around. Now, Miriam, you have to understand, is the person that is the tight purse strings in our operation and always has been. And all of a sudden, she's telling me I'm taking a plane to Las Vegas for a few days. 
<laughs> we didn't know anything about the schedule. Patrick said his his best time open was Friday evening. So I don't know. Is this around that? I'm assuming it's like a weekend event. So I fly down on Thursday, stay with a couple of friends, and I'm supposed to fly back on on Saturday. And so um, uh, I'm having dinner with Patrick on on Friday evening. And as we're walking back to the the place where I'd left my rental car, he says, you know, I'm having this this group of people that are uh, been involved with, with speed grade on meeting on Tuesday night. Could you come? Well, we'd been in business long enough that I knew when somebody asked you a question like that, you don't say, oh, no, I, I've scheduled out. You immediately go, um, well, I'll have to check my schedule on that. <laughs> and so as Patrick's walking away, I'm talking to Miriam on the phone saying uh, he wants me to do something on Tuesday night and I'm supposed to fly out like tomorrow. And so we were scrambling and pretty soon and figured out that it was cheaper for me to fly home Saturday, turn around, get back on a plane Sunday morning and fly back to Vegas. And um, so, th th yeah, there's this amazing event where uh, that uh, that Patrick hosted where I got to meet Joost van der Hoven and, oh, geez, there were people from Canadian Broadcasting and uh, about 17 people or so that had all had a, uh, 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 a history with uh, speed grade. And on the way up to the room where we were meeting, one of the people turns. Oh, somebody said you had dinner with Patrick. And I says, "Yeah." And then he just kind of stopped and grabbed me by the shoulders and said, "How much time did you have with Patrick?" And I said, "Well, we had it was about an hour and a half or something like that." And he says, "You had an hour and a half with Patrick?" <laughs> and he, he was outraged, turning out to the other people. They're going, "Well, I've never had that much time with him." And so you know, about this time, I'm going, "Whoa! Well, that was kind of cool." But it's kind of fun to get the other side of the story so many years later. Yeah. Here. He never told me. <laughs> you, because you see, Patrick is an amazing guy. If you hang around him, things happen. <laughs> Nothing that you expected, Excellent. mind you. But things happen. And you'll probably like it. You, you can go, tell that I embrace serendipity as a concept. I like to bring it to other people. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 Patrick, now that we've got our special guest, um, Done with. Do you have any other questions for Neil? Just, just asking, um, Neil. I'm actually somewhat curious as to what's the relationship between the two of you, because I know you've both been involved with the community and have been trainers. But there yeah. must be that point in time, and I certainly wasn't there for it, where you guys met. And you're, you know, you opposite ends of the world almost. So there's got to be a story there too. Well, we were funnily enough last night. We were we were on a call uh, with each other on a Zoom call till four a.m. my time. It was like six hours. We were just talking nonstop, and we were talking about everything that we just said. Uh, you know, Neil spoke about. So we met really on the ACP channel. That's about mm -hmm. where we met. I found that Neil was one of kind of the most dedicated people I've seen. His answers were never short, like you know they were very you know succinct and but they were pretty long and i'm like who's this guy that's spamming everyone you know yeah. uh, what's wrong with the blade tool um so you just explain it in the line normally and here neil goes back into the archives of the dolby's history and brings out how the blade tool was doing. and i was like all all struck by this person because it takes a lot of effort to do this and that's how we actually met um you know, being a visual effects artist and director and all of these funny things that I did kind of led me to understand the passion behind what Neil was doing. And and eventually your your name came about. For me, the holy grail of Adobe. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonder that Patrick's not up on that Too stage. Much on <laughs> so I hear this word, this guy, Patrick Palmer, Patrick Palmer. I'm like, who's Patrick Palmer? So I go and Google Patrick. He looks like a nice guy. And I said to Neil, he looks a bit... He looks a bit uh, strict i mean you know can you even speak to him and neil's like I'm he's the german he's such a, that's a, <laughs> neil started speaking in german last night he says this is how patrick <laughs> speaks so i said he says he's one of the best guys i've known in my entire life and so patrick the first question if you had to define creativity from your perspective being head of the adobe and artifacts team mm -hmm. to me it has very specific meaning i think largely to me it means looking at the world around you and seeing what questions it challenges it you with, or, you know, sometimes it might be verbatim coming from another person, but there's just, you know, there are a lot of questions and I'm a curious person. To me, creativity means to think about all the possible answers 
and not coming up with the one that's already written down someplace. I think this is kind of also why I kind of like, have, I have a dislike for standardized testing. And that extends to when we're doing interviews for people who want to come aboard with the team. If people have perfect answers, that to me is almost like the opposite of creativity because I'm not looking for that. If there is a question okay. and there is a predefined answer, then why have the conversation? There's nothing in it for me. If there is okay. a challenging question, it's kind of like, wow, that's an interesting. Solution could be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and potentially you'll come up with a ton of different answers. Then it becomes engaging to me. Then it becomes interesting. The creative option there is to choose the one that seems to give you most runway, that gives you most you know, whatever you're looking for in the conversation at the end of the day, it is. You might go for something that's just getting other people engaged, then the answer is very different to any given question as to, uh, you know, versus saying, well, no, this got to produce something immediately. You get where I'm going, depending yeah. on what kind of outcome you're looking for. Just by that, you open up a whole realm of possible outcomes and discussing those, figuring out where to go. That's also kind of why I think eventually I got into product management as a said earlier when when we got started with Miriam, I never really thought of product management as the dream job or where, where I would be going eventually. It's just where I ended up going because that suits my needs in terms of that creative desire that I've got and uh, indeed to to you know deal with my curiosity. And also quite frankly to there's another thing connected to it. And I think every editor, every colorist, every motion design artist, everyone in our industry can appreciate that. There's just something beautiful about getting into the heat of something and then having something to look at a little later and say, hey, look, I've been involved in creating this and it did something for other people. The goal here is for, for us to try and make the learning of the applications and the usage of the applications mm -hmm. fun. It's somehow lost that little bit of magic somewhere along the line. It's become clinical in the education system. Now we want to make it fun. So you want to edit? Go ahead, edit. Let's see what you do. He says you play the guitar. But oh, yeah, no I one do. has seen you publicly play anything, uh, so I've heard. So uh, as a very, very special <laughs> special request, play us a tune and say something sure. about Adobe, maybe in German, who knows? Uh, I have a love for instruments that probably is not very well hidden in the backdrop of my frame. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not <laughs> at all. So we had a question from from Ryan. Thanks, Ryan, about you know whether you have whether you outsource all your engineering. And David mm -hmm. hopped in for saying that you have all of your in house in house yeah. folks and that you've grown quite a bit. To add a little bit to it, Dave, of course, uh, is very much correct in saying that this is all in house. With the kind of products we work on, um, I can't imagine how you would want to push the envelope outsourcing any of the work. This is this is something where you need to build expertise over years, uh, specifically when, when it comes to testing it to dwell on that a bit. It is super important for us to have the best of the best at it because of the complexity and also because of the impact when something doesn't work the way it's expected to and because of the feedback that you get when you have people close to the product that are from the industry. Our quality engineers, a lot of them are actually pro editors in a previous life. And that's something that is very much wanted in our setup as you get very different kind of feedback if you test something at a technical level compared to, there it is again, compared to the creative zone, right? Okay. Uh, if something works, it is a bit black and white almost, right? You can certainly yes. say, this is functional. Doesn't necessarily mean from a creative person perspective, it will do the job. Those two things are very different. Uh, the, the company actually looks at that broadly if you, if you if you think of the all of the creative cloud products i don't think we would ever want to allow for uh for diluted effort there in terms of pushing it forward and and keeping the applications modern contemporary and adjusting to whatever is the need of the decade right every decade had something special in store for us both creatives as much as uh, us adobe producing software for creatives I, I find that peculiar if you just you know look three four years back it seems like nothing much has changed but when i got started digital intermediates were a big thing 10 years ago online or offline editorial was still a, a dividing line that had not much room between and not much opportunity to blur that line nowadays it's kind of like i talk to a lot of editors who really don't care all that much about terminology because it doesn't have impact to their day-to-day -day work. And similarly, it's easily forgotten. 10 years ago was actually the first year that there was a meaningful amount of cinematic work done with an Arri Alexa becoming 
the first universally accepted digital high quality standard camera after Red uh, had pretty much pushed everyone to acknowledge that it's even doable, right? And then lots of other players came in and had their specific angle towards how we actually express the same thing digitally and keep the beauty of cinematic acquisition. And that's a 10 year time frame. How much had to change in everybody's life all across the board, looking at us doing the product as much as everybody using it, giving us feedback as to how much it has to change <laughs> to keep up with the times. It's incredible. 10 year time frame. I find always interesting to look at to see how far we've come in still a relatively short period of time. Go another 10 years back. Mm, some of us uh, were probably still going to school. So, <laughs> so here's a technical question from Roland. So what, what can you yeah. say about that? So, that probably is uh, a refer in reference to something we just made available publicly, which is speech to text as an engine to create transcripts. Uh, that does suggest that at one point in time, hmm, if you do understand spoken word, is there something else you want to do with it than uh, getting that from a dialogue and bring that into a transcript, put that into captions? All of that, by the way, if you haven't played with that and if you're a Premier user, it's in the latest version and it's an enormous time saver. Uh, it, it's one of those features where I'm really proud to say that uh, it's hard to imagine that there is a single Premier customer who's got to do captions who will not enjoy using this new workflow. And for what it's worth, if you haven't updated in a while, the new captions workflow at the same time, uh, I think Neil is staring at it. The new captions workflow is also so much more intuitive, so much more flexible, so much more visual too, right? That's actually something whenever we retouch an entire part of the workflow, we're really keen on making sure that it becomes more expressive in of itself and more discoverable, more accessible. So that as a byproduct, by all means, usually gives you a, a faster turnaround in whatever you push through that environment. But to come back to uh, Roman's question, so is it possible to think of other ways to use natural language processing? Absolutely. That said, at this point, I have a hard time imagining sitting in front of Premiere telling Premiere to cut the current clip by three frames. I'm not quite sure that's actually <laughs> speeding things up. But combined with other, you know, we're having these conversations, they're always fun. Be more adventurous. So if you just basically translate action that right now you mostly do with muscle memory and look, Neil is sitting in front of a setup, right? This is catering to your needs to just go fast from one thing to another without really thinking too much about it. It's really mostly in your hands. When you start thinking about other things such as, hey, Premier, no pun intended. Assemble <laughs> everything from yesterday's acquisition, put it on the timeline, only give me the circle takes and mm. add a little bit of padding, mute the audio, put some nice music underneath it. I'll make coffee in the meantime. And you come back to me and say it's all done. That wouldn't be so bad, right? If if you get to a point where you can kind of get into this, if this and that, then that scenario, I think that question is super interesting, Roland. And, and it's definitely something that I think in the not too distant future, we'll, we'll see some experiments around. It's a logical thing to assume that at one point we can do this. And I think mm -hmm. that's the magic behind the team that you have from an outsider's perspective, because if they weren't editors, they think on a purely technical level and their creative portion would be over. But like Francis Crossman, kind of mm -hmm. you know, I see he edits his own little videos and he puts it out there and, and it's it's yeah. amazing because I see that's the first time I saw a technical guy doing something. Yeah, Francis is one of the product managers on my team and is actually he's actually gone through a, a serendipitiosity, whatever that is. Yeah. He actually was a pro editor and colorist uh, in a former life and joined Adobe as a quality engineer on the color team. And then he moved into this product management position over time because for one thing, he had curiosity about the business part uh, of what went on and at the same time had the urge to combine that indeed with the creative mind and has been close enough with customers as he used to be one. So it all really came together. So this is one of those stories that I love about our industry because in, in a lot of other industries, it's actually true that you have to do it by the book. And I, for one, really enjoy that. Uh, most of the careers from people all around me aren't like that at all, not to say it's about passion. It's about yes. engagement. It's about it's about knowing why you get up in the morning. It's interesting to me that in our industry, it seems like sometimes that becomes overwhelming. So you have to keep that in check to a certain degree, but it's good. At, it's so good that it's there because it, it 
it just creates something else. It creates something different. It creates also something that makes everything less dull and boring. At least that's my perception about it. And probably if you work at a bank and also do video, and if you're listening, no offense, <laughs> but there's a lot of creativity in, in your bank business too. <laughs> I, I would just come out and say, it's seemingly it's not for me. My big question to you is, when is Adobe coming to South Africa? Did I just say that yesterday? Oops. Maybe Once we'll start with done. me coming to Cape Town. What about that? <laughs> Yeah, because it's a, yeah. the producers love it because they just have a big holiday. So <laughs> the, the you know <laughs> the footprint in South Africa is is yeah. a little bit small, but you'd be surprised at the demographic is small compared to the rest of the world. But you you find some really amazing people in this country, and they've become great mm -hmm. directors. And you will never hear me disagree on such a statement. I've actually always been a fan of democratizing pretty much everything. That's actually the reason I got interested in in color grading in the first place because it's been so elite it's been so out of reach for 99.995 percent of the creative industry at the time i got involved with it it seemed outrageous by the way and that's also only just you know a little over 15 years ago keep in mind that's that's still a relatively short time frame yeah, totally. back today most grading seats were five hundred thousand dollars and upwards uh the good ones 1.5 million easily and if you can if you think of what could be done in such suites it was actually quite incredible but today you can do more on your laptop <laughs> 100 yeah. yes. right and that got me interested because it seemed with the first endeavor we've had with that playback product it seemed so easy to enter this particular industry if you have a good idea it wasn't a matter of having enough vc money it wasn't a matter of having the right friends. It wasn't a matter of anything but coming with a good idea. And I still I still think that th that's something special about the creative industry broadly, that a good idea matters, right? I mean, I'm actually surprised that we got into minute 38 here, and no one uh, mentioning Frame.io. <laughs> I was about, uh, <laughs> that, 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 that was yeah, coming. Yeah. That was that's coming. That was coming. Yeah, but here's coming. the thing, I'll connect that with you, and then you get into what you want to know. But it, it, I find this very striking as an example of basically a couple of guys from New York coming from the post industry, see the similarity there, it's striking, seeing a need for something that at the time did exist in mediocre form or mm -hmm. in ways that were too expensive or not accessible enough or not broad. You know, all the things that you could say if you look at this from a user's perspective and say, I think we can do better. So why don't we? Doing a startup, not necessarily knowing whether it will exist the year after, mm -hmm. And just being bold about it, being being aggressive about producing something that you yourself would want to use, it certainly worked for them. And it worked for so many other companies. And you know what? For those that didn't work out, uh, most people just start another. <laughs> yes. I just love the energy in that. And I also certainly love that it, it's pushing, again, the envelope for the, entire, for the entire industry, having such smaller startups with great ideas just come to market and basically you know neil you might have actually actually, actually seen them at nab that year so which brings us to the, the frame io uh, <laughs> sure <laughs> the acquisition or uh, i think it's i'm not sure if it's already been done or you know it's in the process of being done what what do you see as the future for the the acquisition mm -hmm. of, from a purely technological perspective and and how do you think it's going to better what premiere and after effects if it does touch after effects yeah. eventually preface I can tell you why I've always been excited about the idea of Frame.io and our products to come together. Review and approval expands your view towards stakeholders. And that's something that to me is such an integral part of the creative process that every piece of feedback I can get early, every piece of feedback that I can get straight back into the pipeline instead of in another place, another form, something that doesn't actually really flow into the way I look at my edit or whatever it is it, it's been commenting on. That's just a dream come true because there's just less barrier moving forward for most customers to participate in that workflow and to expand it to more people. That's the beauty of basically a framework as Adobe has got with so many users to just make this more pervasive, make this more of a normal thing to do. Instead of saying, well, I still have an opportunity to upload to this cloud service and to send an email to that person and then to basically have the usual nonsense, a mismatch in time, a mismatch in version, all the things that we all hate when review yeah. and approval goes wrong, right? I think yeah. everyone has been there at one point in time. I've, I've done this enough in my life to know that it's a relief to have something become standard, become integrated and, and just be so accessible that you'd be foolish not to use it. So that's that's the obvious thing. I think Frame.io has started a number of really interesting initiatives that point towards where we're all looking towards and nobody's really there yet. The camera to cloud workflows that they've been touting this year 
to me, are the most fascinating example of it. Why not assume that at one point it will become irrelevant to any user of any creative product to know where the footage is? That's something that I'd like to start dreaming about because uh, I'm also in the camp of, of knowing how painful it is if you lose any data. It's painful to get access to something a little too late because there has been something in between, whatever the, the constraint. I'm certainly uh, hopeful that at one point, even giving something final to anybody will just become a lot more standardized than it currently is. The, the maze that we're still in when it comes to deliverables is, is just something that I think that's a technical problem. There should be a solution for it. 100%. Adobe's been rolling around in bed a little bit with Lucid Link. And we've mm. been testing it, Neil and I, and we've been, we're still using it. And it's, it's, it's amazingly great. I mean, fascinating, isn't it? It's yeah, we, we were some of the first people using it. And I have to tell yeah. you, Mo would be on the phone with me via WhatsApp from Cape Town, South Africa. I'm in Oregon on the West Coast of the United States, right? Yeah. He says, okay, I'm dropping a folder onto our Lucid Link file space, which is on Amazon S3 servers in mm -hmm. London, right? Mm -hmm. So he drops a folder of media. He tells me about this. Within about three or four seconds on my computer, my uh, Lucid Link drive, which is, of course, a, a virtual drive. It doesn't actually exist. But my Lucid Link drive all of a sudden shows I have this folder appearing. And within a few seconds after that, it starts showing that I have files in it. I can drag and drop those files into Premiere Pro. I then it can immediately drop them onto a timeline and start working with them. And they aren't even finished uploading from South Africa to London yet but I'm actually putting them on a timeline. It's like magic. You just used the magic word and the magic conversation, which is collaboration. Yeah. I think this has taken turns in the last 12 to 18 months due to the scenario we're all in and still in. The pandemic has, has shifted most people's expectation as much as their opinion towards what it means to do anything with the cloud between you and another person. I've actually seen this movie before in some ways that when there is an extreme event, you might reconsider some of the positions that so far have been holding you back. Uh, thinking of the Writers Guild strike back in 2008, and we already talked a little bit about, I mentioned this earlier, that made an impression on me how, how quickly it became viable to shoot digital. Why? Because it was outside of the union that had something to do with being able to shoot or not. So some people went digital and solved the problem that way, and it turns out it wasn't such a bad experience. Sure. <laughs> and it had some, sure. some advantages also in areas where people said, I'm not so sure. Doing any grading on set at the time had a bad smell. Two years later, became standard. standard so yeah. similar to what you're just saying about being able to share media in ways that in, in years past, even from other perspectives, such as what is the security safeguarding on my media around this? Is there anything in the cloud that I can trust? which sometimes is biased, right? Sometimes it's not necessarily about just very bravely looking at here's, here's how secure it is when it's local. And the surprising answer is always, it's actually not. not it's not 100% yeah. secure. Just because you have it on a hard drive doesn't mean it will exist tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yes. <laughs> so yeah. evaluating that against the risks, which will be other kind of risks when, when something is in the cloud, then it, it just becomes such a more meaningful conversation to say, Let's look at this again because, well, now we have every reason to do so as it doesn't seem very viable to use FedEx for all of our need to co collaborate with each other in remote scenarios. And sometimes being in the same, you know, you guys are on different continents, fair enough. You have a different perspective to it altogether. But I have now a lot of customers working in remote collaboration and they basically live next door to each other, right? It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, sure. it yeah this is, doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Right? So yeah. having something between that uh, you could almost call the glue here is certainly very desirable. And I'm actually glad that multiple companies are taking this on with different perspectives because here's the thing, and that's always kind of the Adobe way of looking at this. It actually isn't all that interesting to look at the technology, but what kind of door it opens towards a future conversation, towards something that can become standard, towards something that can be democratized, towards something that can become a delightful experience too. And from that perspective, Sometimes you might argue you could have done this or that earlier for, for what it's worth. I've heard that already this week. Why didn't you acquire Frame.io years ago? Well, the thing is, now is the right time to do so from every angle you can look at this. It makes sense to, it's kind of nice to do this when everybody says, this makes so much sense. That's when you, it, when you want to do it. <laughs> Definitely. Right. Similarly to the remote collaboration, you mentioned team projects, which we're very much invested in and we're, we're making great progress. They're making that something that is both rock solid and becomes more discoverable for more people. Shouldn't be the experts, hidden secret, hidden gem. I'd rather lean towards this will become the next thing that's magical in terms of 
how easy it is to work with someone without becoming a remote collaboration manager. We don't need more managers in the world. <laughs> so you get where I'm going with this. This is certainly a fascinating area. And I think you're right. If something feels like there is similar to what we said about frame, if there is something magical about it, and it's not the technology, it actually almost never is. Technology is only ever as exciting as to what it enables someone or yes. something. And from that perspective, we're definitely entering that era where I think the tagline for that is indeed work where you want and with whom you'd like. Uh, that to me is kind of the next logical step beyond saying that the software itself and what is required to produce an astonishing amount of production value for whatever kind of story you want to tell, compare what you've done 10 years ago. Everybody on, on this conversation, think back what things look like again, 10 years ago, the quality wasn't quite what, what you're used to today. This would probably just generate the next step change if we were able to say it doesn't matter where you live and it doesn't matter how frequently you can get into a conference room. We'll just keep on going. We'll be creatives. Neil and I spent day and night trying to break Premiere, After Effects and everything in between and see how we can do it. And, and recently... And we succeed at times. We've succeeded many times. I know. Recent, yeah, recently, <laughs> we can't seem to break much. We put a lot of started. energy into making yeah. sure that we close that gap because, uh, honestly, it's worth acknowledging that there has been a gap. We've gone feature-rich in a relatively short period of time, specifically commenting on Premier's journey here. After Effects is very different. But Premier's journey towards becoming a, a very viable editor for a very broad range of use cases, it came with a little bit of a burden, right? We've done a lot of things in a short period of time. And it didn't necessarily give you the reliability that once you rely on this day in, day out, you'd come yeah. to expect, especially coming from a company like Adobe, right? We're, we're, we're not a mom and pop shop when it comes to producing what you would call flagship applications, right? Photoshop standard uh, certainly had to be applied here in terms of gaining perspective towards what this means to the industry. Over the last two years, uh, we've really made sure that quality is always the first consideration, no matter what. We've, we've actually moved into a better state, therefore, in terms of our entire development process as ask any engineer. No one wants to be driven by a date you give them. They're all driven by impact. They're all driven by doing something that's lasting, that's not creating technical debt. It's, it's almost, at one point, it's against any good engineering process, if you will, to say that you're going to aim at anything but something that is a customer delight at the end of the day. Because, you know, same thing. If you want to know why you get up in the morning, no one gets up in the morning to do something that's that's on a spreadsheet and it's executed by the end of the day, right? There is something more about it if you want to create something that is delightful to somebody else. And that desire certainly has been served so much better uh, once we had an opportunity to kind of put the foot off the gas a little when it comes to creating new features. My job at the end of the day, as Miriam has asked initially, and I never find really great answers to what it is I'm doing, but one of the most important things about my work life is to find balance between pushing for something that isn't there and potentially creates that magic, or it's just giving you more productivity, is saving you five minutes a day, which to me is huge. Five minutes a day. If I can do something that gives everyone five minutes back, man, I sleep so much better. Yeah. <laughs> but finding the balance between trying to accomplish that and to make sure that everything all around it, what's already there, is just giving you the oomph consistently, that's a, a good part of the conversation. Can I take Patrick home with me for a week and just lock him up <laughs> and just, 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 just keep him with me? I'll just, yeah, just, I want to make sure that we highlight this question questions. that we got uh, because <laughs> it's from a very different perspective. Barriers to entry is the way that he put it. Yeah, that's an area of focus is the one thing that I'm going to put up front as... For us, that's that's just a very logical thing to do, period. If you look at the opportunity to use multiple creative products as part of a journey or as part of changing job definitions, indeed, that's something to keep in mind with this conversation. You just uh, actually introduced that the, the way I was hoping you would, Miriam. For some people, it's not a choice. And then it's even more important to have the barriers set relatively low. But for some people, it's even, you know, it's something desirable. Be on the move, explore something new. And for both scenarios we're definitely trying to make sure that in terms of our design language we go as unified as possible in terms of having the same thing in multiple applications ideally 
it actually works the same, unless there's a really good reason for it not to. We've actually done that over the last couple of years to make sure that we get on the same footing with other flagship applications and vice versa. It's not like we're only being influenced by others. <laughs> this works both ways. And at the same time, what is a professional in the video industry? The definition of that also has changed much. And some people don't even care. I talk to people who have 20 million followers on YouTube about their video professionalism. And they're kind of like, no, I'm a guitar teacher. Right? <laughs> even though they create the most incredible videos that you've ever seen in that category. And there's a lot of finesse to it. There's a lot of thought towards how to tell the story that's gone into everything from planning on it shooting it, putting it through post, and then eventually posting it, right? I, I, I'm personally, I, I feel like this, this, you know, this is a humbling conversation uh, always when you look at what's happening when things become available, back to the notion that things are being democratized. And you can connect that, that statement once more to how does that work for someone coming from photography, from illustration, from design, and wants to work in the motion design and in the professional video field. I, I think I would always want to endorse that because, well, for one thing, I think this is fun. <laughs> Indeed, it opens up possibilities that otherwise don't exist if you engage in that conversation. So for us, it's really important to make sure we lower the barriers. I would almost want to put that question back as uh, Donnie, who posted that, is apparently about to make that step. I always love to hear what, what are the most daunting problems when you switch over. And I'm going to make an assumption that just, just creating a project, I see that all the time with people coming from stills, where your image is your project, is your canvas. is It's everything, right? And when you close it, everything is in one file. <laughs> Video is so not like that. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you Patrick Palmer on have to guitar. Unmute. Well, let's see if it even comes oh, through because some, some, sometimes these live streaming uh, engines cut That's out great. anything that isn't voice. Does it come through? Yeah, yeah, it comes through. It's okay. Great. Probably have to preface this because uh, <laughs> if I think about the lyrics of what I'm probably going to sing next, it sounds like I didn't have a good time and I certainly wanted to thank you for inviting <laughs> me. But it's true that I like the melancholic songs a bit more than the rock and roll ones. And on that note, <laughs> If I could do any good Mick Jagger impersonation today, I would certainly play a Stone song because I've been really sad about the news of, of Charlie Watts dying. Uh, he, he's been a hero of mine ever since. And man, what a humble person. Speaking of great guys, um, uh, this one anecdote I, I read about, I'll actually tell you before I play. <laughs> so apparently there was this big interview sometime in the 80s and Mick Jagger being a bit full of himself, talking about, yeah, I do this and my drummer does and, and then Watts, I don't think, has ever stepped up to the microphone much in interviews with the press. He got close to the microphone and said, no, no, you, you have this all wrong. This is my singer. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Gotta feel like how tonight Tears of rain I cannot fight Last to help you understand Are you strong enough to be my man? Lie to me I promise I believe Lie to me But please don't leave Yeah, yeah, yeah. Patrick, <laughs> that was just awesome. I guess Adobe is not the right guy. Adobe is not <laughs> the right guy. Uh, lovely, Patrick. It's been Thank such you. a pl pleasure and honor and a privilege. Thanks for having speak. me.